Health Initiative study came out and showed that the conventional hormone therapy, the use of uh, the, the drug hormones, Premer and Provera, that physicians were commonly using, uh, actually had some health risks. Prior to 2004, OBGYNs and family doctors were commonly prescribing hormone therapies for women. And in, in 2004, a Premarin, the, the drug uh, estrogen that physicians were prescribing, was actually the number one prescribed drug in the United States. Well, when that Women's Health Initiative came out and showed that these drugs had some health risks, increase of breast cancer, blood clots, and some other problems, uh, physicians uh, essentially refused to use them. Uh, only use them in uh, very, very rare cases. Uh, but anti-aging physicians and nutritional physicians have continued to use a different type of hormone because we didn't use Premarin and Provera even then. For a long time, we've been using what are called bioidentical hormones. Bioidentical hormones are hormones that essentially are identical to what is naturally found in our bodies. And we have bioidentical testosterone for use in men, bioidentical estrogen, and progesterone for use in women, smaller amounts of bioidentical testosterone for women. And the studies have shown that the use of the bioidentical hormones is not associated with the type of risk that the drugs were. So uh, the anti-aging physicians have been using this continuously. But fortunately, even the conventional OBGYNs are now coming around and realizing that these bioidentical hormones are safe, and they are beginning to prescribe them once again as well. And we need to look at women in particular. Uh, women are now living uh, well into their late 70s and 80s. The average life expectancy for women is about 79 years in the United States. And in some places like Japan, it's, it's closer to 90 years. Yet the average age of menopause is 50. And it really is unfair for women to be expected to live for 30 or 40 years without the benefit of hormones uh, because Hormones are really what rejuvenate us, what keep us youthful. And when our hormones are taken away, we lose our bone strength, we lose our muscle strength, we lose our hearing, uh, we lose our eyesight, and we even lose our, our, our mental acuity, our energy, and our focus. And the hormones can help us to restore that. So if we have the ability to use these bioidentical hormones that are safe and effective, uh, I think that we should look at this option. The same thing applies to men. Uh, we used to think that uh, high testosterone levels were associated with an increased risk of prostate cancer. So um, most doctors were very reluctant to prescribe testosterone uh, for men as they got older uh, because of fear of prostate cancer. But what we have found out is exactly the opposite. It's actually men who have low testosterone levels who are at increased risk of uh, prostate cancer. Also men who have high estrogen levels are at increased risk of prostate cancer. So while conventional doctors have not got around to checking estrogen levels in men, uh, nutritional physicians and anti-aging physicians will typically not just measure testosterone, but they also look at estrogen levels in men and do what's necessary to optimize testosterone, lower estrogen, uh, so that we can uh, keep men vigorous uh, and healthy uh, throughout their, their later years as well. You and Ray had talked about how in the early days it was thought that 80% of our health is related to genetics and that 20% is based on lifestyle and that it's now flipped. Can you talk a little bit about that, the recent findings? Yeah, that's exactly true. Uh, this rule of 80-20 applies in so many aspects of life. Uh, 80% of the assets of the world are owned by 20% of the population. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> yeah, no, that's actually true. That's the yes. rule of 80-20, which was uh, invented by, uh, discovered by uh, uh, an economist in Italy named Pareto back about 100 years ago. Uh, business meetings, we typically take care of, uh, use 80% of the time to do 20% of the agenda. Uh, and it also applies in genetics. Uh, but we were 100% we wrong about this. We thought that our our genes determined 80% of what was going to happen to us and our lifestyle choices, which are affecting the, the expression of these genes, was actually the other 20%. What we've discovered is the genes are just the blueprints, but our lifestyle choices determine whether or not those genes we have are going to be expressed. So most genes just represent tendencies. So you might have a tendency to heart disease. You might have a tendency 
to be overweight. You might have a tendency to develop macular degeneration, uh, the most leading cause of blindness. Uh, but your lifestyle choices can offset those genetic tendencies to a, to a much greater degree than your genes can uh, because your lifestyle choices can determine whether or not genes are not open. They're not, they're not wide open. The genes that are in your body, most of the genes are covered uh, with proteins. They have like a insulation over them, and they can't be read. Uh, it's only when they're uncovered. But the lifestyle choices you make can, can either keep good genes uncovered and bad genes covered so that you don't need to worry about them. So it's really what we talk about is the expression of genes, and our lifestyle choices control our gene expression. Isn't that great news? It really is because it means that we are in charge of our destiny to a far greater extent than we ever thought before. Just because our parents suffered certain diseases does not mean that we are predestined to develop those same uh, diseases as well. Uh, we, can, we can control that. We know that we have tendencies. We know we have to be more serious. We have to be more careful uh, depending. And that's why I think it is useful to consider doing some genomics testing to find out what diseases we are predisposed to. Don't you find that some people get really scared doing genomics testing because they think if something has a tendency that they're going to get whatever it is? Uh, as long as they, they get this information and they realize that they're empowered and they can be empowered, uh, we've done genomics testing on hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of patients over the years. And I don't think anybody has, has life has been, has not been happy that they did this testing. They were all glad to find out, even if they find they had some uh, the bad genes, because they know that there's things that they can do about it. You had a lot of genomics testing done, didn't you? Yeah, I did genomics testing on myself. I did it through multiple com companies uh, to test the various gene tests that were available. And, you know, I found out I had some, some bad uh, genes, and I've taken some steps in order to reduce the expression of them to reduce my risk. So it's been very meaningful uh, for me. And I mean, it's, it's no fun to find out that you have genes that are bad, but you know, we have 25,000 genes. You're not going to have 25,000 good genes. Some of them are going to be, uh, are going to be undesirable, but even undesirable genes have uh, beneficial effects. So for instance, uh, one of the genes that increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease known as ApoE4, reduces the risk of macular degeneration, this uh, leading cause of blindness. So most genes, even if they're bad, they have a silver lining to them as well. I like that you talked about RNA interference to try to turn off the fat insulin receptor gene in the fat cells. Can you talk about this? Because this seems like this is something most people want who are dealing with weight issues. Well, uh, what we're doing with the uh, what's called RNA interference, if you remember back to biology, our genes are DNA, and the DNA is located in the nucleus. The DNA is double-stranded, and it creates uh, RNA, which then goes out into the cell, and it serves to create the proteins that do the job and do the work of what needs to be done. It, it's very difficult to, to actually go inside of the nucleus and turn off a gene directly with a medication. Uh, we've mentioned that the genes are covered by these uh, histone proteins, and technically, it's a very difficult place to work. So what's happened instead is rather than trying to directly turn off the gene, researchers are looking to turn off the RNA that the gene makes. And that's what's referred to as RNAi or RNA interference. So the scientists are creating molecules that will bind to the RNA and essentially shut it down so that it, it can't make these proteins that are bad. So if we have this, what's called FERCO gene, the fat insulin receptor, uh, the fat insulin receptor, the FIR gene, uh, this gene increases risk of becoming obese. And there are certain Indian tribes, for instance, that possess this gene. And as a result, historically, it helped them to uh, use calories very effectively so that they were able to survive famines. But nowadays, when they are not subjected to regular famines, this has resulted in an extremely high incidence of obesity in these populations. So we would like to be able to turn off that gene, in effect. So uh, they have developed uh, some mice strains, and they're working on some RNA interference molecules. And hopefully we will soon have medications that people will take that will knock out these, these genes so that they're not expressed. 
And 